All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parsha, Monday, July 18th, 2022. We begin a brand new Torah portion. Torah portion is a name that is familiar to us, especially because we read about his heroism at the end of last week's Torah portion. Of course, I'm referring to the man, the hero, the legend named Pinchas, or in the English, Phineas. I think it's Phineas. Anyway, Pinchas. We're going to stick with the Hebrew, Pinchas. So Torah portion is called Pinchas. It's named after him. It opens up by kind of resetting and retelling the story of what he did. And of course, as we read last week, when there was an outbreak of immorality and idolatry, he went in, he took, he took uh, a weapon in his hand, he ended an act of uh, public disgrace and public immorality, thus ending the plague or a plague that had broken out amongst the people, killing 24,000 Jewish men. This plague ended with the bravery, with the, with the strong act of Pinchas. All right, let's jump in. Let's jump in right away uh, and read the text because there's a lot to explore. All right, Torah reading for Pinchas, reading one, chapter 25. Let's roll. Oh, I love how it's called Pinchas here, but the the uh, in, in the translation, it says Phineas, Phineas. I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyway, we're going to stick with Pinchas. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Pin, what's going on there? Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, has turned my anger away from the children of Israel by his zealously avenging me among them so that I did not destroy the children of Israel because of my zeal. Basically, God is saying here that Pinchas saved the day and saved the Jewish people. If not for him, who knows? But because of him, he... Um, he turned my anger away, God says. In other words, he, he um, diffused God's anger, and God did not destroy the Jewish people. All, all, all good things. Therefore, God says, say, I hereby give him my covenant of peace. God is saying, I hereby, I do declare, I hereby uh, make a declaration that I'm giving Pinchas my covenant of peace. What is the covenant of peace? Let's continue. It shall be for him and for his descendants after him as an eternal covenant of kahuna. Kahuna means the priesthood. Because he was zealous for his God and atoned for the children of Israel. In other words, he acted zealously on behalf of God and atoned, kind of you know, fixed and put an end to the mistakes, to the errors, to the sin of the children of Israel, thus granting them atonement and salvation and sparing them from the plague. Now, let's explain a few things. There's a lot to cover. We had like three verses of content. I mean, one, the opening verse and then three verses after that. But already I have like three or four ideas to share. Number one, Pinchas is once again introduced as the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. The question is, why is his lineage traced for a few generations? Pinchas, okay, we know who he is. No, he's the son of Elazar, and who's Elazar? The son of Aaron, the Kohen. Why are, we, why are we tracing the family tree over here? Rashi will explain, Rashi will explain something phenomenal. And I'm going to tell you Rashi a little outside, and then we're going to do it inside. Rashi explains that there was suspicion, and there were rumors, and there was murmuring and shushkering that basically Pinchas was a hothead that he was a vigilante, that he was somebody who was looking for a fight, that he was somebody looking for blood, out for blood. He was somebody who was otherwise looking for violence. And that's why he stepped in. That's why he, of all people, stepped in to, uh, to kill uh, the, the individuals that were sitting at that moment, namely Zimri and Cosby. Why? Because he, well, he himself was a hothead. He was a vigilante. He was looking for blood. Therefore, the Torah says, no, that's not the case. Who was Pinchas? He was the son of Allah, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. Who was Aaron, the Kohen, or Aaron, the Kohen? He was the Kohen, the, the, the high priest. And we know one thing about Aaron, Aaron, the high priest. He always preferred P. 
peace. He pursued peace. He loved peace. He loved reconciling things. Pinchas was a descendant of his grandfather, Aaron the Kohen. In other words, uh, flowing through his veins was the blood of love, not of justice, not of violence. It was love that was coursing through his veins. And yet, at this moment, at this time, this is the action that had to happen. And so he took the action. This tells us something profound, a very profound lesson that we get to right away. And that is, sometimes our nature might be one way, but the, the situation calls for another form of behavior. We might be very peace-loving. We might be very peaceful, peace-loving individuals. And yet, when the moment arises, when the moment calls for it, we have to take decisive action. We might prefer not to, you know, not to cause any, um, what's the language I'm looking for? Not to ruffle any feathers or not to, you know, cause any waves or anything like that. We, that might be our preference. Our personal preference might be peace and love and, you know, not, 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 not causing any disturbances. But when the moment arises, when there's a plague, when there's death happening, sometimes you got to step up. You got to step up and do your thing. To give an example, to give an example, you could have somebody that is otherwise a pacifist, otherwise somebody who believes in peace, who not only believes in peace, desires peace, pursues peace, um, is, is all in about peace. And yet, the question is, will they defend their family? Will they defend their family against danger? Will they defend their loved ones themselves against danger? Or because they are a pacifist, so it's like, uh, okay, okay, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You can do whatever you want, right? That would be wrong. That wouldn't be a pacifist. That would be immoral. For, for Pinchas, because he's his grandson, grandfather's grandson, because he takes after, say this in English, because he takes after his grandfather, who loved peace, pursued peace. He was a peaceful guy as well. But for him, because of his peaceful demeanor and disposition to not act decisively, when the situation demanded that someone act decisively, that wouldn't be him employing the value of peace that would be him being an accessory to the blood to the bloodshed an accessory to all the dying that was happening and that's not okay the message of the torah here is that you and i we need to be prepared to act contrary to our natural disposition for the sake of what's right if we only follow our innate or natural dispositions, we might be missing very important opportunities and callings and demands of us to step up. That's the message of Pinchas. He was not a bloodthirsty dude. He was not a vigilante looking for a fight. He was a guy who was obsessed with peace. And yet the situation demanded that decisive action be taken and he took it. And that's why, to go back inside, let me share my screen once again. That's why. That's why God says, what, what is the reward or what is the consequence of his action? I give him my covenant of peace. Briti shalom, I give my covenant of peace. He did not act out of a sense of violence, out of a sense of, of, of vigilantism. <coughs> he acted out of a sense of peace and love because he loved his brothers because he loved the Jewish people, he needed to end the plague. And that's how the plague was going to be ended. And that's why he gets the kahuna in verse 13. That's why his reward is to get the priesthood. You should know that although he was a grandson of Aaron, he was not a Kohen. Pinchas was not a Kohen. The reason why he was not a Kohen, you're probably wondering, what do you mean he wasn't a Kohen? He was... He was from Aaron's family. Of course, they were all Kohanim. They weren't. They weren't. Let me explain. Initially, when the institution of priesthood was formed, Aaron was the high priest. His four sons, initially four sons, were priests. Nadav Avihu, Elazar, Itamar. Well, Nadav and Avihu died. Okay, so now we have Elazar and Itamar. So Aaron, Elazar, and Itamar. Elazar was the, was the oldest of the remaining surviving sons of Aaron. All the individuals mentioned, Aaron, Elazar, Itamar, they all became Kohanim. And 
any children born, any sons or children really born to them subsequent to that moment in time would also be born as Kohanim. But their existing progeny, their children that they already had, were not granted and gifted the gift of Kohanim, the gift of priesthood, which creates a very interesting scenario. Aaron was the high priest. Elazar, let's just focus on him. Elazar was a priest. At that moment in time when that institution was created, Elazar had a child named Pinchas. He had a son named Pinchas. Pinchas was not a Kohen. His father was a Kohen. His grandfather was a Kohen. But since he was already born at that time, he was not granted the priesthood. The priesthood only went to Aaron and his sons. Did not go to the grandchildren. It would go to the children subsequently born, but not to those who were already born. Pinchas was already born into the family. He was not gifted the priesthood until this moment in time. Because of his decisive actions, because of his, dare I say, peaceful actions, even though, again, the act wasn't a peaceful act, but it was about creating peace, it was about uh, saving lives, etc. Because of that, he is granted the priesthood. He now becomes a Kohen. Now let's uh, let's continue the narrative, and then we're going to go into Rashi's. I hope this makes sense. Um, okay, now now the Torah does a little housekeeping, explaining who everyone was in the story. Now the name of the Israelite man who was killed, who was slain with the Midianite woman, right by Pinchas. Who? What was his name? Z was Zimri the son of Salu, and he wasn't just a man. He was actually the chieftain of the, well, the Simeonite paternal house. In other words, he was the head of, he was the leader of the tribe of Shimon. He wasn't just a guy. He was a tribal leader, as I explained last week, in multiple classes. Let's continue verse 15. And the name of the Midianite woman who was slain together with him, her name was Cosby, the daughter of Tzur a national leader of a paternal house in Midian. She was also a uh, big mach, macher, macheres, macheret. I don't know the, 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 uh, the feminine version of that. Anyway, she was also someone very prominent, the princess, the daughter of a prominent leader in, uh, in Midian. Okay, and those were the two who were slain. Now, in the aftermath of this entire situation, remember how we got here. Let's remember how we got here. Let's recall. The Jewish people are advancing on the land of Israel to the promised land. They're on their way. A few nations have told them to go around. The Jews went around. A few nations came out to fight. The Jews fought The Jews fought and defended themselves and were victorious. Moab, the nation of Moab, led by the king Balak, is afraid. They're terrified. They hire Balaam to curse. They join up with Midian, etc. The curses don't work out. But Balaam, the evil prophet, before he goes, he says, I can't curse, but I have advice. Advice is get them involved with immorality and idolatry, and God's not going to be happy. And so it was. Moab, Midjan, these two nations that were um, trying to bring down the Jewish people, they sent their daughters, the daughters of Moab, the daughters of Midjan, the Midianite princess, to attack um, spiritually. I mean, not just spiritually, like uh, ethically, morally, morally and spiritually. The, uh, the Jewish people through immorality, through acts of immorality and acts of idolatry. So at this point, God says, now it's time to fight back. Take a look at the very next verse. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, distress the Midianites, distress the Midianites, and you shall smite them. For they distress you with their plots, which they, which they contrived against you in the incident of Pa'ar. And in the incident of Cosby, their sister, the daughter of the Midianite chieftain, who was slain on the day of the plague that had come because of her. In other words, they attacked you. Maybe they didn't send an army, but they sent their daughters, their princesses. They sent their idols, the Baal, Baal Par. They went after you. Now you go after them. They attack you, counterattack. Distress the Midianites, and you shall smite them. Okay, and this does play out at some point soon. All right, let's hold this for a moment and let's pause here. Let's take a look at Rashi. Let's take a look at some Rashis. 
The Torah, as I, as I, the first thing that I mentioned today is that the Torah um, charts the lineage of Pinchas, the son of Elazar, son of Aaron. Rashi explains why I said this outside, but let's read it inside. Since the tribes were disparaging him, Pinchas, they were saying, ah, that guy, ah, bloodthirsty, saying, have you seen the son of Puti, whose mother's father, Jethro, fattened calves for idols and who killed the chieftain of an Israelite tribe? Let me explain. The people were saying there was gossip. You know, people gossip, right? It's, it's terrible. People, people gossip. People say things. What was the gossip? Pinchas killed, the, killed these guys. You know why? Pinchas. It was grandfathers on the other side. We know on one side, it's Aaron. On the other side, it's Yisra, Yitro, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Yeah, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was also the father-in-law of Elazar. Elazar also married one of his daughters. And so Pinchas' grandfather was also Yisro. So they said, oh, you know who Yisro was or is still alive? I don't know if he was still alive at that point. You know who he was, what he did, what he's done in his life? Jethro. He fattened calves. He was a, he was a Kohen Midian. He was the priest. This guy worshipped everything. This guy was like a spiritual guru. He served every idol out there. And the way he used to do it is he used to fatten calves and then slaughter them to the gods. That's cruel. Not just slaughter a calf. He would fatten it up just for the slaughter. That's a very deep level of cruelty. Imagine you fatten something up and you make it feel like you love it and you're caring for it. Here's more food and more food. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I love this guy. Boom. And you kill the animal. By the way, in Jewish law, you never do that. When it comes to the sacrifices, you and I, we've all learned together. Vayikra, the whole book of Leviticus, multiple times. Not once, not once do we find the idea that, you, that you're supposed to fatten up the calves or fatten up the animals before, um, before, you, before you slaughter them. Not once. It's not a thing. It's, it's a level of cruelty. It's one thing to sacrifice. Okay, that, that requires its own explanation. But to fatten up for the sacrifice. So they were saying, oh, Pinchas, oh, his grandfather was a cruel guy. He had a, he had a cruel streak in him. So he also has that cruel streak. That's what the rumor was. So God says, no, 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 no. He doesn't take after that grandfather. He takes after his other grandfather, Aaron. He's a lover of people. This action was out of love, not out of, not out of uh, zealousness or out of a streak of, of viciousness. All right, back inside. Let's, let's see how Rashi uh, finishes this off. For this reason, scripture traces his pedigree to Aaron to, uh, to, to take away from the, uh, the people who said, oh, he's only doing it. He's only doing it because um, if his, like, he takes after his grandfather, Yisro, Jethro, who was a cruel, a cruel man. All right. For his zealously avenging me um, by his avenging my vengeance. He avenged, God is saying, my vengeance by his releasing the wrath that I should have released. The term kin always denotes someone motivated to take vengeance for some matter in old French, en prenement, en prenement. I don't know if I'm saying that right. En prenement. Okay, something like that. Therefore, say here we my, You don't know, okay. Um, mm. By the way, I have the Rashi <laughs> said, right. not with me. I have the Rashi said at home, the, that was, the, the one that was beautifully gifted to me. By uh, by all y'all, via Mark. So uh, I know in there, I'm sure it, it's got that broken out. So maybe I'll take a look at it when I get home, and I'll share it tomorrow. All right, back inside my covenant of peace, that it should be a covenant of peace for him. Just as a man owes gratitude and favor to someone who did him a favor, so here God expressed to him his feelings of peace. God says, oh, thank you so much. I'm extending my gift of peace to you. Shalom to you for doing what you did. All right, let's continue. What's going on here with this? Um, it shall be this covenant of mine, mentioned in the previous verse, shall be for him an eternal covenant of kahuna. That's the gift. That's the reward. Although the kahuna, listen, and Rashi says what I said to you outside. Although the kahuna had already been given to Aaron's descendants, it had been given only to Aaron and his sons who were anointed with him and to their children whom they would beget after their anointment, no, subsequently. Pinchas, however, who was born before that, and had not never been anointed, had not been included in the kahuna and the priesthood until now. 
And so we learned in Tratit Zvach, and Pinchas was not made a Kohen until they killed, killed Zimri. Pinchas was not a Kohen until Zimri was killed uh, for his God, for the sake of his God, as in, are you zealous for my sake? I am zealous for Zion, for the sake of Zion. Okay, he wasn't zealous for God, it was for the sake of his God. All right, the name of the Israelite man in the place. Scripture traces the lineage of the righteous man for praise. It traces the lineage of the wicked man for shame. In other words, just, so, just like we traced the lineage of Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron. So just like we, we, we trace the lineage of the hero, we do the same with the villain. That's what Rashi says, right? We, we tell the name of the, of the Israelite man, Zimri, the son of Salu, the chief in the tribe of Shimon, right? So we trace the lineage of the wicked man for shame. Chieftain of the Simeonite paternal house, of one of the five paternal houses belonging to the tribe of Shimon. Another interpretation to proclaim the praise of Pinchas, for, for although Zimri was a chieftain, he, Pinchas, did not refrain from acting zealously against the profanation of the divine name. This is why scripture tells us the name of the one who was slain. Aha, I like this one also. I like this one also. In other words, it's telling us that Pinchas didn't balk. He didn't hesitate. He didn't like freeze because this guy was, you know, a prominent dude a leader of a tribe, Pinchas says, I don't care who you are. This is what's going on. God's not happy. People are dying. We're going to end this. All right. The name of the slain woman uh, and the Torah name, sir, because we thought of Tzor, why? To inform you, Rashi says, of the hatred of the Midianites toward Israel, for they submitted a princess to prostitution to entice Israel into sin. In other words, that's how much they hated the Jews. They, they didn't just send anyone. They sent their own princesses. That's next level. Next level, um, a national leader. He, her, her father was a national leader. He was one of five Midianite kings. Avi, Rechem, Sur. That's later on in, in the book of Midbar. It lists the Midianite kings and it lists Sur, her father. He was the most prominent of all of them. As it says, a national leader, but because he degraded himself by abandoning his daughter, he is listed only as the third king. Interesting. He was initially the most prominent, but he sent his daughter. That's like... Anyway, so he's uh, he was demoted to third. A paternal house. There were five paternal houses in Midian. Epha, Efer, Hanoch, Abida, and Elda'a. This was the king of one of them. Let's continue. Verse uh, Rashi. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Rashi to verse 17. Distress. Sarar. Rashi says, like, Zachar, remember, and Shamar, keep. What's the connection between distress, remember, and keep? Uh, it's a term describing a continual action. As if to say, you must constantly show hostility toward them. In other words, just like remember, when it talks about Shabbat, remember the Sabbath. It means a constant remembrance. And Shamar, keep Shabbos, means constantly keep it, right, for all time. So to distress the Midianites, Sarar, like Zachar, like Shamar, they all rhyme, Lashon um, Haiva means an ongoing thing, distress, and always distress the Midianites. Not that we know who's Midianite today, but just in theory, it would still be a thing. Um, for they distress you with their plots. The incident of Cosby, by submitting their daughters for prostitution so as to entice you to stray after power, that's the idol. He did not order, oh, and now you're wondering, hold on, why just Midian? Why distress the Midianites? Why take revenge against the Midianites only? What about the Moabites? Remember? Moab, Moab, that was the, the king, uh, Balak was the king of Moab. They joined with the Midianites against the Jewish people, but why only one nation was punished and not the other? Rashi explains, God did not order the destruction of Moab. Why? For the sake of Ruth. It was destined to issue from them as stated in the Talmud of Baba Kama, 38b. That's unbelievable. God preserved the Moabites just for one woman who would ultimately later be born to that to the mid, to the Moabite uh, nation. Her name was Rus or Ruth, and she would eventually be a matriarch. She would convert to Judaism, be a matriarch amongst the Jewish people, and her great great whatever grandson or her great grandson was King David himself. God spared an entire nation who started off with the Jewish people 
just for the sake of one woman who would ultimately be born from them. And her name was Ruth. That's an unbelievable Rashi and Talmudic statement. Pretty incredible, if you ask me. All right, back inside. Back inside. Numbers chapter 26. We're going to toggle Rashi off and jump back into the text. Um, just so you know what's happening here. And I mean, we're about to read it, but you're going to see. We're about to get into the next census, the next count of the Jewish people. Now, as you, you all were with me a few weeks ago when we started the book, uh, or several weeks ago, when we started the book of Numbers, and I explained it's called, I mean, the Hebrew is called by Midbar, which means in the desert, which is where the, the setting in which all this stuff happens. But in English, it's called Numbers, and even in Hebrew, it's called Chumash Epigudim also. It's the book of, uh, book of counting because there are so many um, uh, episodes of counting the Jewish people in this, in this book. And here's another one. Here's the next census. It's at the end of the 40 years after the plague that broke out, killing many of the men. This is the next census. Let's go. It was after the plague. The Torah clarifies that it's after the plague. So God now is, okay, how many do we have left? Not that God doesn't know, but that we should, we should know. It was after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Elazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, saying, it used to be Moses and Aaron. Now Aaron has passed away. So it's Moses and Elazar. God spoke to them and he said the following. Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upwards. Similar pattern, military age, men following their father's houses, all that are fit to go out to war in Israel. Military age men, 20 to 60. Moses and Elazar the Kohen spoke with them, with the people in the plains of Moab by the Jordan of Jericho, saying from the age of 20 and upward, they, 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 um, they delivered the message to the people. Uh, hear ye, hear ye. I'm adding that from the age of 20 and up, as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel who had come out of Egypt. All right. Uh, we just launched a census. We're going to continue that in the next reading, but let's just see. Um, let's just get some Rashi's here. Rashi, it was after the plague. This can be compared to a shepherd whose flock was intruded by wolves who killed some of his sheep. He counted them after the attack to know how many of them were left. Another interpretation, when they left Egypt and were entrusted to Moses, they were delivered to him with a number, with a count, with a census. Now that he was close to death, and would soon have to return his flock, he returns to them with a number as well. Two powerful rationales. Number one, number one, because a plague had just broken out, it's appropriate to do a census like the flock and the wolf after the wolf attack. And then the second explanation is also really powerful and I don't know, very emotional also. When Moses was given the people to lead, they were counted. When Moses hands them back, they're counted again. So, so did he know, was this, was this, did he know that he was going to like dive in? Did he know he wasn't going into yeah. Egypt at this time? Yeah, in Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, at this point, he knew he was told by the hitting of the rock. Um, he knew that he wasn't going to the, going to go into the promised land. And he knew that the end of the 40 years had come. And he knew that the Jew, that they were really close to the border. I don't, I don't know that he knew an exact time and date, but he certainly knew that the end was near. And, uh, and that that would be, um, you know, kind of the final count, as it were. Either way, it's a, it's a commandment from God. Uh, you know, God commanded the original censuses, multiple, and God also commands this one. It's not like Moses just on his own chose, like, hey, you know, before I step out, you know, here's the thing. Even though that's how Rashi kind of paints it, but it's more of like it's appropriate, you know, when you start and when you end, to just, you know, do the accounting and have everything uh, everything tied up. On that level. Um, let's take a look at, hold on one second. Okay, yeah, verse, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, checking up an, a, a previous verse for, for a moment. All right, uh, verse number two. Following their father's houses, their lineage followed their father's tribe, not their mother's. So it's interesting, once again, we have this idea that we've had before, Tribal identification goes by the dad. Jewish identity altogether goes after the mom, right? So the Jewish lineage is maternal. 
but the tribal lineage or affiliation is paternal. Verse number three, Rashi. Moses and Elizabeth the Cohen spoke with them. They spoke with them, with the people concerning this, namely the Yomni present that God had commanded to count them, saying, they said to them, they said to the people, you must be counted from the age of 20 and up, that they be counted from the age of 20 and upwards. It says everyone who goes to the counting from the age of 20 and upward. Okay, all right, I think we got it. All right, moving on to reading number two. And here the Torah lists the names of the tribes and the tribal families. Let's go. Reuven, Israel's firstborn. The descendants of Reuben were the family of the Hanochites. Hanoch, from Hanoch, the family of Paluites. Sorry, Paluites. Paluites, from Palu. The family of the Chetzronites from Chetzron, the family of the Carmites from Carmi. These are the families of the Reubenites, and they numbered, oh, here's the census. Here are the results. They number 43,730. The sons of Palu were Eliab, the sons of Eliab were Nimuel, Datan, and Abiram. Ooh, yeah, those were the villains also. There, Datan and Abiram, the chosen of the congregation, <laughs> chosen, who incited against Moses and Aaron, the assembly of Korach, when they incited against the Lord and the, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and Korach. And that assembly died and when the fire destroyed 250 men, and they became a sign, a cautionary tale for everyone else. In other words, as the Torah counts, the family, the tribe of Reuben, the, the tribe of Reuben and the families, the Torah mentions the various members, including Datan and Abiram, who were part of the Korach revolt, the Korach coup, and uh, were swallowed by the earth. The Torah, though, slips this in. Korach's sons, however, did not die. FYI. FYI. Korach's sons did not die. Rabbi, are you saying Korach or Korah? What do you say? I'm saying Korach with the ch. Okay. Um, yeah, the English has it. They drop okay, off. Yeah. The, yeah, they drop it off. But yeah, it, this is Korach from the from the dude with the coup. So Korach joined together with Dasan and Aviram, Dathan and Aviram, and uh, they died. And that's why it's mentioned here in the, in the context of Ruvain, the tribe counting the tribe of Ruvain, because they were of that tribe. The Torah though slips in. Korach's sons did not die. His sons did not die. What happened? As I've explained before, the Talmud says that the earth opened up. They were swallowed alive, but they didn't fall all the way down wherever the other ones fell. There was a place, a little perch that they had, and they remained there until they eventually made their way out and rejoined society. But it's very weird. It's very interesting. I say weird. It's very interesting that it's mentioned over here that the sons of Korah did not die. It's like we're talking about the, the tribe of Reuven, the census of Reuven. And Korach was a Levi. He was from the Levites. But in the context, once we mention that Dathan and Abiram died because they were swallowed, the Torah says, oh, FYI, Korach's sons did not die. Did not die. The Rebbe explains this. I'll just jump right into the explanation. The Rebbe explains, you know, why is it, why didn't it tell us when we read the story of Korach that his sons were spared. Why, why over here, weeks later? Because they only emerged later from the earth. When they were swallowed, they were swallowed together with everyone else. It was only later at some later point, I don't know how long it took, some later point that they made their way out of the earth and rejoined society. So because they spent some time under underground, so the Torah doesn't reveal that they rejoined, that they, that they, that they survived, until a little bit later in the Torah's narrative, just like the people on earth, the Jewish people found out that, oh, hey, I thought you guys were swallowed. Oh, no, we, I thought you guys were swallowed. No, we survived. Oh, just like everyone else found out a little bit later, we're also finding out in the Torah a little bit later that they actually survived. Kind of brings us into the action as it happened. Um, the descendants, okay, so that's tribe number one. Tribe number two, the descendants of Shimon, Simeon, according to their families, the family of the Nemulites from Nemuel, the family of the Jamanites from, ja, from Jamin or Yemin, the family of the uh, Jachinites from Jachin, really Yachin in Hebrew, the family of the Zerachites from Zerach, 
the family of the Shaolites from Shol. These are the families of the Simeonites, Shimon, 22,200. Notice how little they were, how small they were, 22,200. Just follow me for a second here, 22,200, okay? Look at how many Ruvain, uh, Ruv Ruvainites there were, 43,750. 43,750. And these guys are only 22,200. So um, the, the explanation is, because it was the tribe of Shimon that really got hit. The Simeonites got really hit with the, um, the activities over with the, with the Moabite daughters and the Midianite daughters and the, the Pa'ar worship and all that stuff. That's why they sent their tribal leader to, uh, to, to save them. And uh, that was Zimri and, 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 and his uh, relationship with Cosby. So the point is that they were decimated by the plague. They only were left with 22,200. All right, tribe number three. Descendants of God, according to their families, the family of Siphonites from Siphon, the family of the Chagites from Chagi, the family of the Shunites from Shuni, the family of the Uznites from Uzni, the family of the Erites, the Erites from Eri, the family of the Aradites from Arad, the family of the Arielites, Arielites from Are Areli. These are the families of God, according to those of them counted. And once again, we have a a much higher number than Shimon, 40,500. The sons of Judah, next tribe, the son of Jude, sons of Judah were Er and Onan, but Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. They died long, long before. The sons of Judah, according to their families, the family of the Shalanites from Shelah, the family of the Parasites, 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 from Parasites, the family of the Zarachites from Zarach. The sons of Parasites were the family of the Chetzronites from Chetzron, the family of the Hamulites. From or Hamul, it's from Hamul. These are the families of Judah according to those of them counted. Wow, this is a big number. Let's see, 76,500. The sense of Issachar according to their families, the family of the Tolaites from Tola, the family of the Punites from Puva. No. It should be the Puvites, not the Punites. I think Puva. Oh, no, 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 ha, Hapuni, no, that's correct. The Punites from Puva, okay. The family of the Yashubites from Yashuv. The family of Shim, uh, Shimronites from Shimron. These are the families of Issachar, according to those of them counted, 64,300. The sense of Zebulun, Zebulun, according to their families, the family of the Saradites from Sarad, family of the Elanites from Elon, the family of the Yachleites from Yachleel. These are the families of Zebulun, according to those who have counted 60,500, also a big number. The sense of Joseph, according to their families, Manasseh and Ephraim. The sense of Manasseh, the family of the Machirites from Machir, and Machir's son was Gilead, the family of the Gileads from Gilead. These are the family of the sense of Gilead, the family of the Yezerites from Yezer, the family of the Chelekites from Chelek. The family of the Asrelites from Astra, the family of the Shechemites from Shechem, the family of the Shem, Shemid, uh, let's see, Shmida, Shmidites, Shmidites from Shmida, the family of the Heferites from Hefer. Now, now, Tzalavchad, the son of Hefer, we just mentioned Hefer, right? Um, this is the tribe of Menashe. Now, Tzalavchad, the son of Hefer, had no sons, only daughters. And the names of Tzalavchad's daughters, because they would inherit the land, as we know, were Machla, Noah, Chagla, Milka, and Tirza. These are the families of Manasseh, and those of them counted were 52,700. These were the sons of Ephraim, according to their families, the family of Shuthalites, 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 from Shus. From Shuselach. It's easier for me to hear. The family of the Bachrites from Becher, the family of the Tachanites from Tachan. And these are the sons of the Shu Salach, the family of the Aaronites from Aaron. These are the families of the sons of Ephraim, according to, them, uh, according to those of them counted, 32,500. 
These were the sons of Joseph according to their families. Next, the sons of Benjamin according to their families. The family of the Baileyites from Bela, the family of the Ashbelites from Ashbel, the family of the Achiramites from Achiram, the family of the Shufamites from Shufam, the family of the Chufamites from Chufam. The sons of Bela were Ar and Naman, the family of the Ardites from Ar, the family of the Namites from Naman. These were the sons of Benjamin according to their families, and those of them counted were 45,600. The sons of Don, according to their families, the family of the Shuchamites from Shucham, these are the families of Don. All the Shuchamite families, according to those of them, counted 64,400. Nice. Can I know her? Sons of Usher, according to their families, the family of Yimna from Yimna, the family of Yishrites from Yishri, the family of the Bayrites Be from Beria, from Bri, sorry. Briites, sorry, Briites from Bri. The descendants, the, uh, sorry, Briites, from Bria. The sense of Bria, the family of the Heverites, from Hever, the family of the Malchielites, from Achliel. The name of Asher's daughter was Sarah. Sarah. She lived many, many years. These are the families of the sense of Asher, according to those of them counted, 53,400. The sense of Naphtali, according to their families, the family of Yachtzielites, from Yachtziel, uh, the family of Gunites, from Guni, the family of the Yitzri, Yitzrites, from Yetzer, the family of the uh, Shilemites from Shilem. These are the families of Naphtali, according to their families, and those in the count were 45,400. All right, Whew, we did all 12. Final tally. These are, the, these are those counted of the children of Israel, 601,730. 601,730. 601,730. All right. This reading, if you want to know what reading two was, the census, we list all the tribes and their tribal families and their numbers and tally them all together with, of course, the exception of the Levites. Okay. We got a few Rashi's here. Let's jump right in. The family of... Hanochites. Now it only works in the Hebrew. Rashi's interpretation is only going to work in the Hebrew. Why do we say the Hanochites, the Paliadites, like why all the ites? In the Hebrew, it's not ites. It's He at the beginning, Yod at the end, and the name of the tribe or the family, the tribal family in the middle. There's Hanoich, that's the family, Hanoich, and then there's the family Hachanoichi. The Hanochite family. Why? To say Hanoich. Why Hachanoichi? In other words, there's a letter He and a letter Yud added to each name, as we'll see. Since the nations were denigrating them, saying, how can they trace their lineage by their tribes? Do they think that the Egyptians did not exploit their mothers? If they mastered their bodies, all the more so did they exercise authority over their wives. People were laughing at the Jewish people. Oh, you think your tribal lineage is pure? Are you kidding me? You guys were slaves for 200 years in Egypt. Don't tell us that uh, you don't have a lot of Egyptian blood in the families, that the tribes are not really the tribes, that everything got mixed up. If the Egyptians were in control of the men's bodies, certainly they were in control over their wives. Therefore, the Holy One, blessed be, that wasn't true. It wasn't true. That's what people claimed, but it wasn't true. Therefore, to counter this claim, the Holy One, blessed be, he appended his name to them. The letter He on one side and the letter Yud on the other side. As if to say, I, God Almighty, I bear witness for them that these are the sons of their fathers. God says, I know. It's not Hanoich. Ha Hanoichi. A He and a Yud, that's my name, says God. Yud and He is my name. One of the names of God. I'm putting my stamp, my stamp of lineage on these families. This is stated explicitly by David, the tribes of God, testimony to Israel. This name, the Yud and the Hay, the name of Hashem, testifies for them regarding their, their tribes. For this reason, in each of them, scripture writes, Hachanachi, Hapalui, the Hanachites, the Paluites, in which each name begins with a Hay and ends with a Yud. But in the case of Yimna, 
it is unnecessary for it to say, Hayimni, since the divine name already is affixed to it, the year at the beginning of the Hayti. Oh, interesting. That's why the tribe of Yimna, the family of Yimna, doesn't need Hayimani, whatever, because it already, it's already Yimna, it already, ha, already has a year and a Hay. That's cute. All right. Um, Dasan and Aviram, they were from Ruvain, and they were the ones who incited Israel against Moses and Aaron. When they incited the people against the Lord, incited means they enticed Israel to quarrel with Moses, a causative term. They became a sign, a sign and reminder so that no outsider who is not of the seed of Aaron shall approach to dispute the kuna anymore, the priesthood. No one should challenge, look what happened to these guys, the earth swallowed them. Korach's sons, however, did not die. Rashi, quoting the Talmud Sanhedrin, says, they were originally involved in the conspiracy. But during the dispute, they contemplated repentance, just contemplated. Therefore, an elevated area was set apart for them in Gehenna, that means in purgatory, and they stayed there until eventually they came out. All right. Um, let's skip this Rashi. From Osni, Rashi says, I believe this was the family of Etzbone. I do not know why his family was not called after him, why they changed the name. In Genesis, there's also mention of the names, but there's a little bit of a discrepancy here, and Rashi says, I'm not sure why that discrepancy. Okay. Um, Yashuv. This is Yov. Listed among those who migrated to Egypt, for all the families were named after those who migrated to Egypt. But as for those born from that time on, their, family, their families were not called after them, except for the families of Manasseh and Ephraim, or Ephraim and Manasseh, all of whom were born in Egypt, and Arunam and the sons of Bela, the sons of Benjamin. This answers the question that you might have had. As we're counting the tribes and listing the tribal names and their families, the question is, are these the only ones? 70,000, 60,000, 50,000, 40,000 people, you have three or four families? It's not possible. Yeah, the answer is right. The Torah doesn't mention all the families. It just mentions the original families that came down to Egypt. That's, that's, that's who we're tracing the lineage back to, those original families, with a few exceptions. Obviously, Ephraim and Manasseh, because they didn't come down to Egypt. They were born in Egypt. And there's also one more exception that Rashi is about to share. Um, Arnam on the, uh, yeah, sorry. I found in, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, Amanash and Ephraim and Arnam on the sons of Bella, the sons of ben the son of Benjamin. Why was, why, why were they mentioned? I found the writings of Moshe Darshan, the preacher, that Arnam's mother migrated to Egypt while she was pregnant with them. I guess they were twins. She's pregnant with them. <laughs> Maybe twins. And that is why they formed separate families, just as Chesron and Chamul, who were Judah's grandsons, and Hever and Malchiel, who were Asher's grandchildren. If this is an Agada, all well and good, we must accept it. If not, I maintain that Bella had numerous grandchildren, and from two of them, Aranam and two large families issued, and the sense of the other children were called after Bella's name, whereas the sense of these two were called after them, Aranam, because they were so big, so they had their own unit. Similarly, Rash says, I maintain that the sons of Machir were divided into two families. One was called after him, one was called after his son Gilead. Five families are missing from the sons of Benjamin. And here the prophecy of his mother, Rachel, was partially fulfilled. She called him Ben-Oni, the son of my mourning. As a result of the incident of the concubine at Giva, which is in the book of Judges, in the prophets, it was completely fulfilled as nearly the entire tribe was wiped out. I found this in the writings of Ramesh Adarsh and the preacher. Very interesting. I don't know that I want to get into all this detail, but a very interesting point that the tribe of Benjamin lost five families here in this count. And eventually, ultimately, they would lose more um, with the very terrible incident where they attacked this woman, this concubine, Giva. The tribe of Benjamin was attacked by the other tribes. It's a terrible uh, bit of a civil war that happened in the book of Judges. We'll leave that for another time. Okay. Um, these are the sense of Shusalach. The descendants of the other sons of Shuselach were called after Shuselach. A large family issued from Aaron, so they were called after him. Thus, the descendants of Shuselach were considered two families. Go and figure it out, and you will find that 57 families are listed in this chapter, together with eight from the sons of Levi, totaling 65. This is the meaning of what it says, for you are the least of all the people. The word hamet, hamaat, uh, hey, maat means five, less. 
You are five less than the families of all the nations since they are 70 and you are 65. This too, I, I, I expounded from the writings of Ramesh Darshan, the preacher, but I had to delete some of his words and add to them. So Raksha says, I, I, I'm taking this from Ramesh Darshan, but I'm modifying it. I, uh, I adapted it from his writings. Interesting. 70 nations of the world, 70 primary nations, 65 Jewish families. Hey, Ma'at, Hamat, five less than, than the, uh, the nations of the world. Achiram, this is A, he was migrated to Egypt since he was named after Yosef, who's Benjamin's brother, and greater than he, he was called Achiram, Achi, Ram, brother, great. Greater than his brother. Shufam, this is Mupim. So named because Joseph was humbled, Shafuf, among the nations. From Shucham, this is Chushim. Name of Asher's daughter was Sarah because she was still alive. OMG. She was still alive. She's mentioned here. That's amazing. You should know Sarah, she's the one who broke the news to Jacob that Joseph was still alive. She played music and she sang to her grandfather. Again, she was the daughter of Usher, the daughter of Jacob. So her grandfather was Jacob, patriarch Jacob. She played music. I don't know, I picture a guitar. And she played music for her grandfather. She sang to her grandfather, Yosef is still alive. And her grandfather was so grateful for the news about his son, Yosef, Joseph, being alive. And for how she broke it to him in a gentle way with a song that he blessed her with long life. She was still alive centuries later at the time when the Jews entered Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, that takes us to the end of today. All right, what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the story? A few things. A few things. Number one, number one, don't stick with your nature when the moment calls for something else. Don't be afraid of taking action because it's not in my wheelhouse. Sometimes you got to throw away your wheelhouse and do whatever is needed. Sometimes you got to abandon your comfort zone to do what's necessary. Pinchas was not a violent guy. He was not an angry guy. He was not a, a physical guy. He was a peace guy a peace-loving fellow, but he took the size of action. That's what the moment called for, and he became a Kohen, a man of peace because of that. Not became a man of peace, but he was granted the official seal of peace because of that action. Never stick to your comfort zone in opposition to what's needed from you at that moment. And finally, the second message that I wanted to point out was, hold on, what was it? It was from, from the second reading. Oh, the power of teshuva, the power of repentance, the power of um, the power of even thoughts of teshuva, the sons of Korach, they were part of the conspiracy from the beginning, and yet they had second thoughts and they were spared. The power of teshuva, we should never write ourselves out, never say, ah, I can't fix it. Can't fix it. I've been doing this too long. I've been struggling too long. I'm never gonna get, I'm never gonna get out of it. Don't, don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on the other person. Things can change in an instant. And whether or not we see it, the change could happen within the other person. Always believe in the other. All right, that's it for today. Questions, comments? No, all good? Nice advice. <laughs> all right, awesome. Great, great to see you, Sarah, Sandrine. Great to see you guys. Um, we'll catch Welcome. you tomorrow, same bad time. We'll see you. Thank you, Rabbi. Pleasure, pleasure. Have a great day. Take care. Nice Bye -bye.